Welcome to Real Time Review. This is a show tackling the latest movie releases. I'm Jesse Nussman. With me, as always, Atlanta film critic Jason Evans. Uh, Jason, this week we are talking about Kenneth Branagh and um, Agatha Christie and detectives with giant walrus mustaches. <laughs> um, we're, of course, talking about A Haunting in Venice, which is uh, Branagh's third adaptation of Agatha Christie's uh, Hercule Perrault. Uh, detective series uh, previously adapted uh, Murder on the Orient Express and Death on the Nile. I think probably two of her most famous yeah, they really novels. Are. I was less familiar with this one, which I believe is not even specifically called Haunting in Venice. It's called like the something. The ha it's like the Halloween party or something right, like that. Right, something yeah. like that. We're, are you a big Agatha Christie fan? Because I think this is an interesting sort of prism for us to yeah, so dive I'm, into this. I'm not, but because I grew up in the 70s, I'm familiar with the 1970s versions with Peter Ustinov and Al uh, Albert Finney, Sean Connery was the 1970s mm -hmm. films of Death on the Nile and Murder on the Orient Express. I saw those growing up. So when Kenneth Branagh did those, I already knew the story. Mm -hmm. And it was just a matter of kind of waiting around to see what I expected to happen actually happen. They, they, were, they were fine movies. I, I thought I thought Death on the Nile wasn't as, I thought Murder on the Orient Express was a little better than Death on the Nile. Neither one of them were that great. But yeah. This was the first time I was able to sit in one of these mystery films and absorb it the way you would if you were reading an Agatha Christie novel and didn't know how it turned out. And I, I think that helped me a lot. I enjoyed this film more than the other two. I probably like this I hear more than the other two as well, which I, I should say, I don't know is that much of a compliment because I really disliked the, <laughs> the other two adaptations. It's sort of- To me, they were both like fine. This one rises to good. The, I, so maybe this is like, I think this one is, is fine, whereas <laughs> the other two are bad. Um, you know, it's interesting to me that, like, it makes sense a bit that Brana has sort of wrapped his arms around this in sort of our age of franchises and IP. Yeah. Um, of Brana is someone whose taste can be both um, very classy. I mean, he's obviously very known for his Shakespearean adaptations in the 90s, but uh, Brana is also a real ham and <laughs> <laughs> loves to just sort of do big theatrical acting. And so there's something that kind of makes sense to this if he gets to don this ridiculous mustache and do this kind of like murder parlor mystery with all these big movie stars. Um, this one, I think, benefits a little bit from it's also kind of a ghost story, so it has a little bit more atmosphere than kind of the other two films that he did, which I, I think we'll get into some of the maybe problems with kind of like the mystery itself at the center or yeah. what I think are some of the problems, but I think adding that extra sort of paranormal um, veil to it kind of gives it a, a little bit more energy and a little bit more style and mystery than the other two films had. Yeah, so one of the things about this film that is interesting to me is I feel it's it's such an interesting marketing exercise. They are really marketing this like as a horror film. Mm -hmm. uh, the 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 commercials, the trailers, you know, feel like a monster movie kind of thing. Like like you said, a ghost story. I guess it's a ghost story. To me, it's more of a mystery. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is certainly not anything close to a horror movie. So I was I'm I wonder a little bit about how audiences are going to react to it because people expecting horror are not going to get what they expect from this film. Uh, people expecting a ghost story, maybe, but that's not a huge audience. On the other hand, people expecting a mystery, maybe will be turned off by the trailers and not know that that's really what this is. Sim you know, in that in that regard, similar to the other films, uh, it's an interesting choice by the marketing department. I'm not sure I you can tell. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I agree with it, uh, but I think Kenneth Branagh executes it well. He does a, a nice job of at least for the first two thirds or so, weaving this sort of ghost aspect into it, um, and and it helps the pacing. I think to have that. Well, and it's interesting you bring up the audience aspect to it, because something that I was thinking about through, throughout at least the last two of these, because um, I would say Death on the Now kind of fits into this point I'm about to make, is this is a very, like, traditional, old-fashioned version of a, like, very familiar kind of mystery story. Yeah. I, you know, I almost feel like we don't really need to explain the plot of this movie, because... If you played Clue with your family at any point in the last several years, like you kind of know how the, these murder parlor mysteries work. You know, it's a bunch of big stars that are all in. In this case, it's this building in Venice that's supposedly haunted, and someone's going to die among the cast. We have recent Oscar winner Michelle Yeoh. We have Jamie Dornan. We have uh, Tina Fey, even. Yeah. And you're just sort of kind of like, there's this Alfred Hitchcock quote where um, Alfred Hitchcock was actually like very 
critical of Agatha Christie's murder mystery novels. Um, and I, I think they're like pretty fun. There's pleasure to be had in him. But his, but his big critique was kind of, you're just sort of sitting around kind of waiting for the detective to kind of, you know, lock everyone in the house and then, you know, give this huge monologue where he basically explains everything. And that's kind of been somewhat of my problem with the Brana adaptations of these Agatha Christie novels is Bran is not really someone whose style is typically sort of perverse enough, I think, to kind of get that kind of tension. And it's even interesting comparing it to something like, I think audiences will be very familiar with the Knives Out series, yeah. which I think compared to Agatha Christie, you know, their relationship to that is sort of like Scream compared to all the other slasher movies, the sort of the Knives Out movies being this kind of like very meta uh, series that is aware that the audience knows the beats and sort of conventions of this series and is like, how can we both poke fun at that and kind of flip it on its head and do something a little bit subversive? And I'm, I'm curious, do you, do you think that that series being as popular as it is, people can kind of then slide back into a more familiar version of those sort of same beats and rhythms because I, I would say that makes like a little bit of an unintentional struggle for me is as much as I enjoyed kind of the ghostly aspects of this movie and think it is better than the other two I still kind of got the feeling like I'm just sort of sitting around waiting for Kenneth Branagh to twirl that mustache of his and then sort of like explain to us here's who actually did the murder this time yeah so two things first of all comparison to Knives Out uh, the the dialogue, the the character building, uh, the world building to some extent in the Knives Out films is way better than these films. There, there, there's, a, there's a reason that Ryan Johnson and those Knives Out films are like best picture contenders and these are just, we're debating whether it's good or fine, <laughs> you know? Uh, so, it, you know, maybe if audiences, if there are people out there who are like, I love that mystery kind of thing, mm -hmm. this this will satisfy their appetite a little bit, but it's not Knives Out. Uh, the other thing that strikes me is, and this is something that bothers me whenever I watch these films, I would prefer as an audience to be able to try and join the detective in solving the crime. I'd agree. I mean, that's why you're there. You're like, ooh, here's a mystery. Let's see if I can put the pieces together. And I think for the most part in these Agatha Christie films, in the last two and again in this one, there's not much of an opportunity for the the clues no. aren't presented to the audience in a way that allows us to piece them together. They're not even presented in a way that allows us to go back and go, oh yeah. I mean, in this movie, there's one little aspect there, of it. That there's one little specific right. one that we won't spoil, but right. I but, agree. But for, for the, the most, most part, right, yeah. for the most part, we can't go, oh, I should have seen that coming over here, and then it would have let, you know, it just as you say, it's just. Kenneth Branagh suddenly goes into a dialogue and explains stuff that we never saw or had an opportunity to, to notice. A, a footprint in a, um, uh, in a fireplace mm -hmm. that, that the camera never showed us. We didn't have, you know, there yeah. was no way for us to, to observe that. And he uses that to then turn things completely around. It's fun to see him doing his thing. Right. But as an audience, we're passive observers. We're not active. Right. Well... Any last thoughts on... It's almost one of those movies where it's sort of like, I don't know, you can just stay home and watch Clue. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, well, look, look Clue's, Clue's a comedy. It's completely different in that regard. Uh, the one thing I would say that I did enjoy about this film that we haven't talked about yet is I think Kenneth Branagh really shows his confidence as a director. There are a lot of things he does with the camera, with camera angles, with camera positioning. I almost that, took a good laugh because, like, sometimes he can overdo the Dutch angles a bit oh, on he, his movie. Yeah. If anyone has ever like gone back and watched any footage from the first Thor movie, it's like he's adding in Dutch angles and stuff where like it doesn't even make sense. Um, I agree; it makes a little bit of more sense here because it's meant to be more kind of uneasy. But well, right. It, I was gonna say it contributes to the atmosphere right. a lot. Uh, but with with that being said, I think he 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 does start to struggle with it. The middle third of this film, mm -hmm. like the movie's a, a brisk like 100 minutes. It's pretty short. Yeah, yeah, which which is merciful. Um, but even even with it being fairly brisk and, and there being you know a mystery at its core that should propel us, I found the middle third I was a little bit like, 
okay, can we, can we move it, you know? It, it is that kind of problem, again, that you sort of mentioned of, like, that middle chunk of the movie. You are just kind of, like, sitting there being like, all right, well, now we have to, like, go into this room and yeah. talk to this person, and then I got to hear them give their spiel. And there really isn't that feeling of you kind of being caught up in the mystery and sort of discovering the clues in real time. It's just sort of this interview process until you get the kind of climactic big monologue speech. Which, by the way, is something that Ryan Johnson does way better in Knives Out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, we can move on. Let's talk about music. Yeah, let's, let's talk about music. <laughs> uh, so we get a rare opportunity here to talk about an older movie that's actually coming back into theaters um, that I would highly encourage people to check out. It's uh, Jonathan Demme's Stop Making Sense, which is his uh, iconic concert film with the talking heads. Uh, I would venture to say I think it is the greatest concert film ever made, and I'll maybe get into that here in a little bit. Um, but is A24 is putting it back into theaters and for its upcoming 40th anniversary. I think what is so unique about this movie is most concert films, you're, you're just sort of satisfied with sort of like the camera kind of holding back and you just sort of watching a performance play out. I think what is really interesting about this is Jonathan Demme, who most people probably know from like Philadelphia and Silence of the Lambs, Something Wild, I think really works with David Byrne and the rest of the Talking Heads into how can we make this cinematic? How can we play with lighting and camera angles and the sort of theatricality of the performance you're watching and give you something that is not just like I'm watching, I'm seeing a filmed version of like a show I've missed. Um, you're seeing a, a cinematic experience in a way and as a movie that sort of slowly builds from kind of this sort of like small collection of musicians kind of having fun and playing around on stage and messing with lamps and stuff like that and then sort of gradually grows and gets larger and larger and more kind of operatic as it goes on. I, I, I just think it is it is a real testament to I think like what all you can do with a concert movie that is very different from what we typically see. And there's really even kind of like a blueprint to I think like a lot of music video work that you see come along later in the 80s and into the 90s. Um, I, I know you're not a huge Talking Heads fan. Yeah, and, 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 and I'm going to admit, <laughs> I, I, I haven't seen the remastered new mm -hmm. version. I didn't see the original 40 years ago. So I'm not the person really to talk about that one that much. Uh, you know, it's just, I, I feel like a, a challenge that you have with any concert movie is if you're not into the music, mm -hmm. You're probably you're probably stuck. I would at least tell people like it is it is worth sort of checking out at least you know for an exposure to the Talking Heads or an, and at the very least I think you can kind of like admire sort of the craftsmanship on display and sort of the the showmanship for lack of a better word and 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 kind of all of these sort of fun inventive things Demi and David Byrne and everyone else on stage is sort of doing to kind of take this from neck to the next level apart from just sort of like they're going to get up there with their instruments and kind of mess around on stage is it really does become this kind of giant pop art extravaganza in a way. All right, so I have a concert movie that I saw the other day okay. that is newly out. Uh, again, it's a classic. It is uh, Bruce Springsteen's 1979 No Nukes concert. These were three concerts that he put on in Madison Square Garden in 1979. And I, I'm, I am, I'm a bigger fan of Springsteen than I am of the Talking Heads, but I'm, I'm not like someone who has gone and seen Bruce perform live multiple times. And, you know, I've, I've listened to his music. His music is part of the soundtrack of, of me growing up, but it's, it's not, uh, you know, I'm not like the world's biggest Springsteen fan. I I'm going to tell you something crazy. So the way I watched this movie, I was on a Delta plane. I was flying to Europe. Just as Nolan intended. <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> I was flying to Europe, and I was looking through all the movies that they had because I was sitting here and, and bored, you know, on my Delta flight. And I came across this concert film, Bruce Springsteen, No Nukes Concert. And I, and I was like, how can you even begin to watch a, a, a film that's going to really be about an audio experience on an airplane? But I started watching anyway, and I was, I soon found I was completely captivated by it. It does such an incredible job of capturing Bruce Springsteen's energy. And I think, you know, we forget, the, the 80s gave us, you know, um, 
Born in the USA and Dancing in the Dark and these other songs that made him a huge pop star. But the way Bruce Springsteen burst onto the scene was as a concert performer. That he, he was, you know, he was the one concert everyone had to see because there was so much energy. And I was stunned by the way the filmmakers back then in 1979 captured that energy on stage and brought it out in this movie. Like I said, I'm seeing her watching it on a Delta flight and I felt like I was in Madison Square Garden in 1979. It, it is, first of all, it's exhilarating to see Bruce Springsteen, who's now probably in his 70s, I haven't checked. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, late yeah. 60s, early 70s at, at, the, at the most. Probably, yeah, certainly he's in his 70s. To see him that young is, is exciting and fun. And, and again, just the, so much of the energy and enthusiasm jumps off the stage. It, it, it's a, I, I thought it's one of the better concert films experiences that I've ever had. And again, I was sitting on, a, on an airplane while watching and I can't imagine how good it would be in a, you know, you won't see it in theaters. It, it's it's mm -hmm. streaming on a number of different platforms, but if you have a good home theater setup, man, check this one out because it is, it's absolutely worth it. Well, I'll have to check that out. I'm sure most of our uh, audience will probably think we're just, uh, Wa have washed up music taste because they're probably just <laughs> right. going to go see the Taylor Swift concert. Anyway. Right, yeah, exactly. Uh, but Jason, as always, thanks for stopping by, and uh, we'll talk to you next time about the latest new releases. Sounds good.